Hi, this is Mike Pfeiffer. Um, I'm going to do a little video on how I did my backdrops. I've had some guys ask um, how it's done. And it's just going to be a quick overview. I don't have any uh, backdrop to build at the moment, but I can certainly tell you how I did do what I have done and take you around the layout and show you some pictures and explain to you what I've used for some of them. And uh, it might be helpful to some of you. Uh, so here we go. Um, as you can see behind me here, this corner back here, all the corners are coved and um, round so that you don't have any uh, showing square corners. Um, to do that, it's not very hard. All I did was cut a uh, an angular piece of wood out of a 1 by uh, 12 and then I, after I got the square cut out, then I took a um, a radius tool that I used on the HO layouts, but you could use anything, a piece of string, and make a radius from corner to corner, however sharp you want that to be, and mark that on your board, and then just cut that out with a jigsaw. I make two of those for each corner, so that I can uh, put the masonite to that. And by the way, this is masonite up here, uh, one eighth inch masonite, and to get it to conform to corners, uh, once you have those corner pieces cut, uh, what I do is I soak the back of it with water. I turn it over on the rough side and just soak that with water. I have been known to actually even run a hose on it and let that soak and sit for about 15-20 minutes once your piece is cut to the right height. Then you can go in there and start it where you need to start it at a joint. Go in and push it in at the corner and then you should have some one by uh, twos in the back on the wall is what I use for support and just be able to screw or nail, I use paneling nails, into the 1x2's on either side of your bend and that will hold it in place. And now we'll probably just get into color. Okay, getting into color, um, I'm not much of a color guy as, as um, people would probably think. Uh, I just go outside and or even look at color chips and I say, gee, that'll look like a good sky color. I don't know, maybe some people don't like the sky color that I choose. Um, it doesn't matter, it only has to be good to you. But nevertheless, I just pick a sky blue color, whatever it is, and I know there's a lot of techniques of using a darker blue on the top and painting the top and working your way down, mixing it with white and trying to make it lighter at the bottom. Um, all of this that I do here um, hasn't been done that way. Uh, I paint the whole backdrop first and then I go back in and everything else you see here is either done with an airbrush and or a uh, spray can. It's real easy. The backdrop I paint with regular latex paint and usually a roller. And then I'll get into a little bit more about possibly using some rollers and, and brushes on some of the mountains and stuff that are real easy to do, background mountains. Uh, but for now, let's just stick to the sky and the clouds. Um, these puffy clouds that you can see in the back, actually let me swing the camera around here just a little bit. Okay, these puffy clouds that you see here in the background, I do with a stencil. I just basically tear a piece of cardboard, just tear the edge to whatever shape, and get about six or seven of those together. And I just hold it up there, pretty close but not touching the backdrop. Use the white spray, uh, just feathering the edge. Then I tilt it or move it a little bit or use a different one and spray a little bit more until I like the way the cloud looks. Uh, these particular clouds here have a dark underside to them. That can be done afterwards with an airbrush. But for right now, you're just getting the texture of the clouds. Some of these I've even freehanded. Some of this one here, these puffy, very puffy ones up here, were just done freehand with a spray can from a distance without a stencil. You just have to keep practicing. If you don't like the way it turns out, paint it over with the blue again and try it again. It's no big deal. You've got an open palette here, okay, to work with. Uh, like I said, but but when uh, when it comes to fading the paint or fading the blue down to the backdrop, like I said, I don't use any of these fancy methods. What I do is I take the spray can and I start holding it far back and misting that lower area all of the, all the way down, and I try and do the misting a little bit darker as I get down towards the bottom, and I think it gives a pretty good effect. Not as good as some I've seen painted, but I'm not that painter. Um, so. 
Anyway, to get the dark blue to light color, just use the can, stand way back, mist on, and, and just barely do the center, and then just hold it longer and longer the further down you go. Okay? And that gets your basic um, color on the background. Now, for some of the background mountains, we're going to have to swing around here, and I'll explain how I do some of the background mountains, and we'll start there. Okay, for some of these background mountains, such as back here, it's as simple as mixing a, a, your blue color that you have on the background with either some darker blue um, or some gray or maybe even both. You can try anything or if you prefer green tones you might want to mix a little bit of green into it as well. Uh, but basically all I do there is it's just a wash and I just take the wash and about a two inch wide brush and just work it along the edge and then just start stippling my way down so that I fill in the whole area and pretty much just leave it that way. Um, when you come to some darker edges here, you're stippling on something that's a little bit heavier to make an overlapping mountain. This one doesn't, you know, it's kind of naturally got some in it, but I could have gone in with a little bit darker and stippled in front of that to give the impression of another hill towards us from there, uh, but I didn't. Uh, a couple other places I have. And now I'm going to move you over here and show you how I did a flat top mace over here with a little more, more work involved. Okay, I know that I'm for the most part going to be out of this picture, which is probably good for you all. But um, anyways, this particular hill here, you can see it's a, it's a flat top mesa, which you may or may not be modeling. But all I'm pointing out is what can be done. Uh, same method used. I made the basic shape just using a brush and using the light gray color. Then when I got through, it looked like the other mountain. It was just kind of splotchy, and I thought, well, gee, I, you know, I need some, some vertical lines to that to make it look eroded or give it an erosion look. So all I did was mix a little more black into the same mix that I had, a little bit just to make it just a little bit thicker and a little more black. Then I took and dr mostly dried the brush off a little bit and then just went in there and streaked down with, with the brush in whatever pattern I wanted. And... Uh, it looks kind of ugly when you first do it, and maybe some say it looks ugly now. I don't know, but but still, I think it gives a good effect of a mesa back there. And I could have used reddish colors, reddish tones. Uh, like I said, if it was a regular mountain, it could have been green. But you can see the work that went into this in the vertical striping of it, as opposed to this hill back here, which is meant to look a little bit further away and not as much detail. And then, I don't know if it's in the camera view, but right over here, there's some that are real low to the backdrop, and they're very, very light colored. So, you know, you can vary it up for the distance away you want them. Cl generally, the closer they get to you, the darker the mountains are. And I'll give you an example of that down here in the corner. Okay, this is just a quick example of how the depth of the different hills, as they go back, get lighter and lighter. And as you can see, of course, it's a paper backdrop up next to the front here, but you can see how it's bright green, then it gets to be a little lighter green, then it gets to be a gray green, and then all the way back to the large mountain in the back, which is totally gray. And the same technique of the striping used downward on that. And uh, from this point on, uh, I think what I'm going to do is just basically show you how I mix and tell you what buildings and backdrops I have used and what I've done to make them different. Uh, and how I use them. Okay, as I said, in this part uh, I'm going to take you around the layout and show you how I did the different backdrops, how I blend stuff to stuff I painted, um, how it all comes together. Uh, I explained to you that I do not use any of the printed sky on any backdrop. I, uh, uh, I prefer to paint, as I have explained before, and then just use the building outlines and the mountain outlines and how I blend that into the scenery. Uh, and I'm also going to show you a little bit of detail that I did on top of a mountain back here that has a little bit of snow on top of it. But anyway, it's all going to be handheld camera work, which is good for you all. You won't have to look at me. So let's get started with that. Okay, what I'm going to do is basically just go from one edge of the layout all the way around. And you can see here, uh, pretty much what I did is just dab these mountains on in the background out of gray paint. Uh, no really spectacular thing. Uh, the top of this uh, uh, barn was cut right out of a Walther's catalog. Uh, as you can see, a little hokey looking tree there. I'm not sure I like that too much, but that was a, a stamping thing that I got at Hobby Lobby and put on there. 
Um, this mountain here was printed right off of Google, right on paper, that dark mountain in the background. And that Medusa cement was right out of the Walther's catalog and stuck into the background back there. And as I move my way around here, you can see that I've hand painted uh, these hills here above, which is not hard. You just use uh, a gray color and dab on the darker color on top to make the canyons, the shadows of the canyons. And I did that all the way up through these trees over here. And when I swing way around here, you'll see there's a mountain that I painted back there. And also you'll notice on these clouds that I did a little bit of real dark paint underneath with the airbrush uh, to give them the thunderstorm effect. But uh, for the uh, snow on top of that mountain, all it is is white dabbed on top of the techniques that I've already explained to you. The basic mountain technique with a little bit of streaking and so forth. And uh, gray in there to give it different tones of rock and then the uh, snow on the top of the mountain. Now as we swing around here, um, this is a Detail Associates oil field back here. Uh, it was stuck in that area and still needs some color blending. Uh, and it was stuck in there because back here I have an oil well. Okay, so it's to carry the theme on back that there is oil in this territory. I come down and this is the start of our Instant Horizon um, backgrounds. It's, I don't know which one that is. It's one of the desert ones. Uh, like I say, I cut the uh, top off of them and just use the mountain portion. And you can see that, that it kind of has a light color to it. That's because I went back and I sprayed some of my white dusting on top of that to blend it in with the backdrop itself. Okay, I come around. It's more of the Instant Horizon backdrops. If there's ever anything on an Instant Horizon backdrop you don't like, just get some cheap acrylics and match up the color on a uh, butter dish lid and go in and paint it out. If I didn't want that uh, mill there in the background, I would have gone in and mixed up some paint colors that kind of matched that background color and painted in some hills there on top of the backdrop just as I did on the background that we've explained. So I come around and here is an example of where I've taken colors and blended in the arroyo. The arroyo goes up there, blends into the backdrop and continues on going up into the scenery. And as you can see at the top of these hills up here, they're kind of starting to look whitish because I have sprayed over the top of them. As I come on down this way, I decided to add in a volcano back here, or the remnants of a volcano. So I basically turned just a regular mountain into a volcano and tried, not very successfully I might add, to create the effect of a lava flow. I like the lava flow itself, but the blending into the backdrop I'm not real proud of, but um, I guess I can live with it. Um, it doesn't hurt me. Um, so I keep going. I created, started creating these brownish colored mountains by doing my dabbing technique to blend into the roundish hills. And then as we come down here, you can see that they come and reconnect back into a desert instant horizon scene, again, that I've cut the top off of. Uh, this particular one, in a few places, had some uh, saguaro cactus in it. We don't have saguaro cactus in New Mexico. Those are only in Arizona. So there's a hill over a couple of them here. I believe there's one behind that hill. And I believe there's one behind this hill. And then as we go on, you can see, uh, maybe you can see in this video, that right here at the end of this, I tapered this down. And it tapers down to almost nothing. Then it blends into the prairie scene um, of the Instant Horizons. And I cut the top off of that. You can see that it goes along. There's the mountains in the background that we've covered before. Come on down. I've cut all the way around the grain elevator. I might point out at this point here, too, if you cut off any detail, such as that telephone pole, I paint it back on. Okay? Same thing with the uh, walkway on the top of the, the uh, grain elevator. I cut that off, but I went in with a pen, a permanent pen, and put the railing back on, just painting it directly onto the backdrop. And it's pretty effective when you get away from it. Uh, you come down here, you can see that I put, uh, there was a tree in there. I put a dead tree back in after I had cut it off the back backdrop. Uh, more mountains that I've created. 
the original station that was on the backdrop, the original water tower that was on the backdrop. Again, I had cut off part of the dead tree. I went back in and painted the dead tree back in, painted the poles back in in the background. And now we're coming into a transition area, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, now we're in this transition area. This is a uh, country to city transition, I believe. I could be wrong. It's an instant horizon as well. Some of, the, some of you may remember that in this particular area, there's a railroad track. I painted out the railroad track, and I made it a highway. And in this area here was a depot. I painted out the depot. Right back here was a tunnel portal. I painted out the tunnel portal. Um, pretty much, you if you, there's things you don't like, you can put some trees in front of it and trees in front of them that match the trees in the background. It kind of helps blend the whole thing in. Um, this is pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, it goes into a hill, hill section over here, and I basically overlapped the hill onto the existing transition because I believe there was a... I'm not sure what was there. There was a railroad cut, I believe, and I brought the backdrop on the left around to cover the cut and then just blended the paints together. I think you can see some of the green paint that I put on there that actually covers some of the actual edge of the cut. So that transitions from one backdrop to another. Now to the corner where I showed you the depth of field back there. It's basically just a little country area. Then it comes around and starts transitioning into the city. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing some uh, industries being put in. These industries came off of more detail associates backdrops, which are relatively small. You can see at this point also that I've taken some tree trunks and I've actually put foliage or painted tree trunks on the backdrop and actually put tree foliage on the backdrop itself, which is another little tip that you can do to give your backdrop a little bit of three-dimensional view. Um, when I get over here, these are all detail associates buildings, which I say, which, like I've said, are relatively small and are good uh, for for backgrounds. As I come over this way, you'll notice that we transition into larger buildings, which are the Instant Horizon buildings. Uh, you can see that they're considerably bigger, but since I was covering most of them with structures, what I did is cut about two inches off the bottoms of these to allow them to sit lower and give them a, the impression of being smaller, even they're more, even though they're more um, HO scale than they are N scale. I'm going to come on around here. These are some more of the detail associates. The one that's in the corner there that looks three-dimensional is on a piece of foam core board and actually leans up against that structure back there. More detail associates coming around. Uh, here I covered my entrance to my tunnel that goes out into the window in the garage with um, uh, some foliage. Uh, this Railway Express building was cut directly out of a Walters catalog and so was the next building over and then I painted the uh, road or the highway overpass, extended it on over by continuing painting it on over the tops of these other um, cutouts that I did. As we come around here You'll notice that uh, these are more instant horizon backdrops, which I've also lowered an inch or two. And to disguise the fact that they're sitting low on the ground, I put a fence along the edge of them. And then, as you can see, then it looks like it drops into the background a little more. And it, once again, more detail associates buildings, which transition into another instant horizon set of buildings, which have had the same thing done. They're all lowered down. A fence was put on and then back to a small little piece of uh, detail associates buildings. You can also see the mountains in the background here, how they were touched up with different colors to give them some dimension. It's not an artistic thing. It's just uh, dabbing paint on. It really is that easy. Uh, I, I just recommend that you try it. Um, this little business right here um, is cut directly out of a Walters catalog as well. You, you'd just be surprised where you can find backdrop materials. Um, over here is unfinished yet, but I'm hoping I'm putting the Blair Line uh, drive-in over here. 
And I hope that I've covered everything. If I have missed something, um, maybe you can post on this uh, video and let me know what I haven't told you that you need to know. I know it's a lot crammed into a small video. So um, so I think that's where I'm going to stop for now and let, let's say our farewells here. Well, everybody, I know that was kind of a zooming tour around the uh, backdrop, but it, I hope that I didn't leave anything out. It's kind of hard to video and keep in mind what I'm looking at and explain everything that I'm doing, but I think you get the gist of it. And like I said, the biggest key is you don't have to be an artist. There are guys who paint all this stuff on, and I admire them for that, but I cannot do that. But um, I do the best I can at blending pre-made scenes into scenes that I do paint um, back distant paintings. Um, and try to blend it in. It's fairly easy with desert scenes. It's a little more difficult with mountainous scenes with trees and so forth, and I do understand that. I don't have advice for that because that's not what I model. Um, but uh, pretty much for desert scenery, that's it, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this. And like I said before, if you have anything that you needed me to add, I can certainly add that to another video and post it. But uh, I sure appreciate you looking at this video, and thank you so much for the suggestion. I'm glad to see all you guys. Take care.